Ambassador David Gibson and Mr. Clark, Mr. Carlos Clark. We are broadcasting on TNC, the national channel, and live streaming on our Belize History Association Facebook page and our website. So please visit and like our Facebook page and our website. Join as an active member. Get involved. After all, it is you and I and everyone else who make history. And this is a most important part of our history that continues to affect us all today, the Belize-Guatemala dispute. Whether or not to take the dispute to the International Court of Justice is a topic that requires much consideration, informed consideration. We need to know the roots and the routes that have been taken or new routes that can be taken to finally resolve the dispute. Aren't we excited to hear the presentations prepared today? We anticipate having educational spaces like this, especially since we are only a few months away from the designated date for a referendum, right? And we want to all make informed decisions. So, not to delay any further, we will start with protocol. And I will call on Ms. Shanika Moore to lead us in the national anthem. Please join in after the count of three. One, two, three. Land of the free by the Caribbean Sea, our manhood we pledge to thy liberty. No tyrant telling her, despots must flee this tranquil haven of democracy. The blood of her sires, which hollows the sad, brought freedom from slavery, oppression to red. By the might of truth and the grace of God, no longer shall we be heroes of wood. Arise, ye sons of the Bayman's clan. Put on your armor, clear the land, drive back the tyrants, let despots flee. Land of the free by the Caribbean Sea. Nature has blessed thee with wealth untold. Our mountains and valleys where prairies roll. Our fathers of Bayman, valiant and bold, drove back. Invaders, this heritage hold. From proud Rio Honda to Osarstun, through coral isle over blue lagoon. Keep watch with the angels, the stars, and moon. For freedom comes tomorrow's noon. Arise, ye sons of the Bayman's clan. Put on. Drive back the tyrant. 
Thank you, Ms. Shanika. And now I call on Ms. Emily Martinez, member of the Belize History Association for International Prayer. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom, and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct their plans and endeavors so that with your help, we may attain our just objectives. With your guidance, may all our endeavors tend to peace. So shall justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray, O God of mercy, to bless us with knowledge, to be sanctified in the observance of your most holy law and be preserved in union, in that peace which the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen. Thank you, Miss Emily. Uh, now I will call on the president of the University of Belize, uh, Professor Emeritus Clement Sankat, for the welcome remark. Good morning, and let me uh, thank you, Mistress of Ceremonies, Ms. Pinello. I am. Belize. Well done. All protocols have already been established, but it'd be remiss of me not to recognize our, our key partners in this event and their leaders. I want to recognize uh, the head of the Belize History Association. Okay. I also want to recognize the acting president of NISH, Morris. It's all the other sponsors of this event, all the leaders, history profession, both within and outside the university, especially our own Mrs. Francine Sabal, who is head of the history department. I want to especially welcome all these students who are gathered here, both UB students. I, I believe very schools, and I hope one day you will join us at the University of Belize as a student that you be yourself. I also want to welcome the press. Uh, to all of you, good morning once again. Thanks for coming to the University of Belize for this very important, very topical forum on the issue of Belize and the dispute with Guatemala. On, on the claim that, that we're all um, trying to grapple with. Um, you know, as I reflect on this, and to treat with all the challenges that we face at the university, having a forum like this at the university sends a very important message about the need for a strong, vibrant, independent university, a university that can allow for debate and critical thought, unhindered, unimpeded. And it is therefore very vital that the University of Belize be supported and strengthened as a place of enlightenment. 
And I therefore congratulate the organizers of this forum for choosing the University of Belize as their part in bringing this enlightenment, bringing this debate onto our camp and hopefully for other camps. Because the University of Belize is a multi campus uh, entity, and I hope something like this could also be done in Belize City and in Punta Gorda. So I uh, ask of the History Association to take this across the country. I've been given three minutes to speak, already exhausted uh, two, but uh, this is a wonderful moment for me to say what exciting times we are in at the University of Belize. We have just completed our transformational leap, a new vision 2020, and the history department is going to be central in some of the transformation that we wish to achieve. Most of you historians who are paying attention in the education side of history would probably have read or realized that there is a declining interest in the subject. And you just have to see the CXC, Enrollment Statistics, and you, you know, understand that we have a challenge. We must ask ourselves why that is occurring. We need to think about it very deeply. And I charge the Belize History Association to think, why is this occurring? Now, to all the young people, they say that if you don't know about your past, you cannot understand yourselves, you cannot understand who you are, and you cannot understand where you may wish to go. So a knowledge of your own history, your own background, your own culture is very, very important to young people. So knowing history is important for your own personal well-being as it is important for the national well-being. But why is this subject not appealing? There is a view that it is, among young people, not exciting, not taught in an exciting way, that it's all about facts and regurgitation of facts and dates. And I'm, I'm speaking from, from what I've read as a scholar myself. And therefore, we need to look at the teaching of history and the educators, how we train the educators in history to make it an exciting subject. As a young boy in a history class, there's nothing more exciting to be in history than, than hearing about the wars. All the wars that they had in history, over history, it, it excites you, World War I, World War II, things excite you. About the places where these I think what you need to do, think about, is how it's taught to focus a lot more on the people. Who was Columbus? What motivated him and Raleigh and Drake and all of them to come down here? Not that they just discovered the new world, but who were these people? What drove them to be these kinds of What were the places that they saw and visited? So, not a historian, but I'm saying we need to think about how we teach history to make it exciting and not only about regurgitating facts and deeds. That turns students off. We need to be able to make them critical thinkers. History and critical thinking about themselves, their countries, where they're going, and why they may be doing what they're doing. Guatemala issue is an important one. This issue. It requires critical thought on this subject. So, exciting times. I'm very pleased also to say to the audience here that we signed a memorandum of understanding with NISH. And as I said, when we signed that agreement, my hope is that would allow us to make history exciting. Because NISH would become the laboratory for our university students in history so that they can experience and feel the history. They can see the history. It comes alive. I, um, I also want to share with you that the exciting times is where 
dramatically change our history program. Not only history, but history and tourism. The two things are, are so linked here to move towards anthropology and archaeology, and you could see the partnership with NIT and our students working at those various archaeological places. History and agriculture. When I come to Belize, I think about the Mayan uh, civilization here, which we didn't have in the Caribbean, or as well documented. You have a wonderful civilization. How much do our students know about? I'm sure this should excite them. Not only about Columbus and the discovery of the New World, what about this old world that you inherited, which I find so fascinating in Belize compared to the Caribbean? This, to my mind, is where this partnership with Niche and our new programs, hopefully, will excite young people about history. And of course, young people also need to know when they graduate from the university, well, where I'm going to be employed, what are the skills that I'm going to bring to the employer? All of these things need to be factored into the development of our new programs. Academic, but also related to the world of work. Because if young people don't see opportunities in the world of work, they will turn away from a subject. They are very sensible young people. So these are excited times as we rethink what we do. And I'm looking forward to the support of the History Association and Niche as we go forward. I wish to thank you for your attention. I hope you have a very enlightening symposium, and hopefully we will do more of this in the months ahead leading to the referendum. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, President Sankat. And now, to make history even more exciting, I will call upon the chair of the Belize History Association, Dr. Abigail McKay. Good morning, everyone. Beautiful Belizean faces. Look at yourselves. Look at the person next to you. Handsome men, beautiful women. That's Belize, yes? Beautiful flowers. Protocol having been established, I am happy to share some remarks on behalf of the History Association as its 2018-2019 chair, and to remind each and every one of you present that you are members of the Belize History Association. If you have not yet filled out an application form, you're not yet engaged. I encourage each and every one of you, get engaged. Belize needs you. The Belize History Association depends on you to reach its goal of documenting all comprehensive history from the perspective of Belizeans and written by Belizeans. Today's lecture is the fifth effort to share a bit of the story of how we came to be Belize, this land we love and call home. History is what happened before this moment, the here and now. It can be as recent as just this morning. On your way to the lecture, history happened in your life. It can be as long ago as June 1st, 1797, when 14 yay votes to stay and defend the settlement created the context for the battle at St. George's Key 15 months later on September 10th, 1798. It is the history of our beloved Belize, our story, that provides the context and a backdrop when we dispute Guatemala's claim. Our roots, our story, our history. Imagine the routes of our baymen, even as they moved through the dense settlement beyond the Sibun and all the way to the Sarstoon to harness the bounty of this land. As you hear from the speakers, let your mind consider the context 
and the backdrop. Let the information help you shape your position when you, like the Flowers Bank 14, will get your opportunity, if you're a registered voter, to participate where it matters on April 10th, 2019. Information leads knowledge. Knowledge brings understanding and drives away the confusion cobweb. I look forward to today's lecture presentation, Belize Disputes Guatemala's Claim, Roots and Routes. We will get a glimpse of several perspectives in this many chapters story called Belize. We hope it will help us gain more clarity in thought and decision making when and where it matters. I thank you. Believe now and forever. 8,807. Thank you, Dr. Abigail McKay. And now I will call upon Mr. Nigel and Calada for some remarks as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rolando just texted me and told me I have one minute. But uh, a special good morning to Professor Sankat, who, who is morning, sir. Thank you for agreeing to host and the directors of Niche, CEO Katsim, uh, members of the UB faculty, and especially you students who are here today. Special good morning to the presenters. I, my remarks are in my capacity as a, one of the Niche directors and as the one of the members of the National Celebrations Commission who, uh, who have supported the, the, this initiative. We're happy to once again be able to collaborate with the BHA University of Belize in organizing and hosting of this annual event. The first lecture in recent times started in 2011, the hosting of the Prime Minister's Forum on the occasion of Belize's 30th anniversary of independence. And it, at the time, it also included a two-day conference. That conference uh, today is now the Belize National Research Conference. The time it brought together thinkers on Belize who made reflections and examinations of Belize's progress since independence. This feature of our national September celebrations is now organized, we're happy to say, by the Belize History Association, Niche, and the NCC. The support comes with the view of developing greater capacity for research and presentation of ideas, which may help to positively shape Belize over time. In short, I want to say that we're grateful to the leaders of this, this young organization, Belize History Association. We stand ready to support your continued growth. In the same way, I'd like to highlight the fact that the University of Belize has now become a steadfast partner in the promotion of events such as these. You heard the remarks made by President Sankat. In response to his challenge that, has been, that he has made with respect to the teaching of uh, Belizean history, one of the major initiatives that is currently underway in the country is the introduction of a Belizean studies curriculum for secondary schools. Some of the members of that initiative are in this room. One of the strengths of that initiative is the fact that the people who are in the group are diverse thinkers. And we know that as many as people as they are, that's as many perspectives as you will have. And in a multicultural society such as ours, this is an important thing to have. So that all perspectives are represented and researched and presented. The University of Belize has come on board, and it is, no, it is our desire, and it is now coming to pass, that there is a strong link with the university in creating a fresh flow of ideas and research in the years to come. Thank you, UB. Similarly, then, I want to welcome our esteemed and seasoned presenters who will today weigh in with some historical and legal perspective on what is the existential threat to Belize's we look forward to your presentations and the questions to follow. 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and let's get the show on the road. Thank you, Director of the Institute for Social and Cultural Research, Mr. Encalada. <laughs> Sorry. So now I will get the show on the road and call on Dr. Call to take over. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I set out to introduce our presenters, um, just wanted to say this, that Belize's position in respect to the sovereignty of our land and of our people um, is something that unites us. Um, can't think of any other issue that brings us together. But that needs to be premised on sound knowledge, on good critical thinking, and the kind of preparedness that Belize needs to undertake this extremely critical challenge. Having said that, let me just add to what has been said so far. One of the first patriots of Belize are the humble, are the poor, are the most neglected people of Belize, the Maya of Belize. The Maya of Belize were the first people who stood up to Spanish imperialism. And it's because, in great part, to that resistance that the Spaniards did not occupy did not occupy beliefs. And that is critical in our understanding of how it is that we have a belief. <laughs> Quite often, it's the unsung people that are left out in the discussion. I am so happy that through the work of Niche, the Belize History Association, and all of our relevant partners, including the Department of History at UB, um, we are getting to know more and more of the patriots who stood up, not only to Spanish, but also a time to English imperialism in Belize. And again, I have referred to you to the resistance of the Maya against British imperialism in Belize. Let me begin by introducing this morning our panelists, beginning with Ambassador David Gibson, who is founder and coordinator of the Center for Strategic Studies, Policy Analysis, and Research, a, reg a registered virtual think tank which conducts public policy research, advocacy, and negotiation for governments, NGOs, and special clients. Ambassador Gibson holds a BSc in government with honors from the University of the West Indies, has a Master's in Arts in Developmental Studies from the International Institute of Social Studies, The Hague in the Netherlands. He is also trained in international negotiation at UWI's Institute of International Relations and in Boundary Dispute Management 
from the International Boundary Research Unit of Durham University. Okay. Ambassador Gibson was a permanent secretary and then CEO in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was a member of the Belize Guatemala negotiating team. He is currently Belize's ambassador non resident to the Kingdom of Thailand and is holder of the Grand Cross of Diplomacy conferred by the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador. I will also introduce our second panelist, Mr. Carlos Clark is a, is a foreign service officer at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since October 2010. He currently covers the CARICOM desk, bilateral and political relations with African countries, and is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs representative on the executive of the Belize History Association. His alma mater includes Belmopan Comprehensive School, St. John's College, Junior College, the University of the West Indies, and the University of Oxford. Mr. Clark holds a Bachelor of Science in International Relations with a minor in Political Science, a Master of Science in Government, and a postgraduate diploma in Diplomatic Studies. Over the years, he has been the recipient of various awards, including the Professional and Technical Scholarship, the UWI Departmental Award for Most Outstanding Final Research Paper in International Relations, and the prestigious UK Chevening Scholarship. He currently holds, his current interests, that is, include Membership of Young Professionals, Excellence in Public Service, Football, Basketball, and Farm. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Our third, our, actually our first presenter, because he will be presenting from overseas is Mr. David Gomez. David is a development and trade practitioner with 20 plus years of professional expertise in leading and implementing development cooperation and regional integration programs in Africa, the Caribbean, and the South Pacific. He has worked on assignment for the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Trade Center, Geneva, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the European Union, amongst others. He is currently a PhD candidate at University College London's Institute of the Americas and holds a graduate diploma in international development with distinction from the London School of Economics. He also has an MA in international relations with distinction from the University of Kent. And he has a Master of Laws, LLM, in international trade law. He's also a graduate of the University of Belize, where he holds a BA in secondary education. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. David Gomez. Hola, 
on the left. Okay. All right. Well, good morning to everybody in the group. And um, I hope the weather is nice for there. Kind of this way. Sounds like this is really big. So I'll try to walk through the first 20 minutes of the presentation. Um, we're good to go? Uh, all right. So good morning to everybody in Belize. And let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Nich, the University of Belize, uh, for uh, being a part of the panel today. Uh, my presentation uh, looks at the economic diplomacy um, of the Anglo-Guatemalan territorial dispute over Belize. Um, I'm going to run about 15 to 20 minutes and then depending on what the format is, um, you could let me know if there are any questions. So um, for the purposes of today's presentation, I have uh, two research objectives. The first is to provide an economic explanation for Britain's handling of the territorial claim to Belize since the mid 17th century, but with particular attention for this presentation, uh, the 16th and 17th centuries. The second objective is to reveal how English pursuit of commercial and economic interests in Central American isthmus influenced their policies towards Belize and its handling of the territorial dispute over the settlement. I think I need to make it quite clear, perhaps at this point, um, that I'm not focused on um, the legitimacy of the claim or on trying to settle the dispute. I think there are other people who are doing quite splendid jobs in providing the research relevant to that. Uh, my research is focused on understanding British foreign policy and explaining certain things in our own history um, that we've just come to take for granted. Um, notwithstanding this, I believe that the research has the potential for clarifying the historiography as we know it, uh, and perhaps even for strengthening Belize's case. So a brief background. Um, the historical account of Britain's policies towards Belize formerly uh, known as British Honduras in the 17th and 18th centuries, have always been somewhat of a commercial, and on the whole have not been adequately explained. If you look at any of the history books that we, we are made to study, uh, there are certain things in there that are taken for granted, but that historians have not explained to us. The existing body of literature on Belize's history suggests that such policies were dictated by Britain's desire for colonial expansion of territory. But that rationalization seems very much at odds with its policies towards the rest of Central America um, and Spain's colonial positions in the Americas and contrasts sharply with historical events on the ground during this period. Current historiographies of the matter point to settlement of the air by British buccaneers and pirates, turn logwood cutters, not only as evidence of Britain's effective occupation of the territory, but also as an indication of its hankering for a territorial conquest. This historical interpretation and school of thinking suggests motivations of formal empire. Uh, and it emphasizes the role of the state in colonial development and is a standard reference for historical works on the matter of the dis dispute. The prevailing narrative, however, uh, does not sufficiently reflect um, the integral realities, how English pursuit of commercial and economic interests in the isthmus influenced Britain's handling of the dispute over the settlement. It overlooks the centrality of English merchants and key colonial and public figures in advancing Britain's uh, interests in Belize as part of the wider region. And, it, and consequently, what that does is it obscures the true role that what Logwood and the Logwood settlement at Belize played in British policy towards, Central, uh, towards Spanish America. That Britain's Logwood settlement and its rights to cut Logwood are the, at the heart of nearly 200 year old dispute over Belize is not the issue. Rather, um, there is a need to re-examine the rather complex interplay of both economic and political forces which motivated British policy towards the settlement during the period under study. I believe that this is achievable through uh, re-examination of the role of Logwood in the principle of effective occupation on which England based its claims of dominion to the settlement. So that then then I offer an alternative interpretation of the historical evidence related to Britain's policy towards Belize between uh, the mid 1600s and roughly about 1672. Uh, and again, that's for the purpose of this presentation. So one of the things I noticed in my reading of Belizean history 
is the almost complete disregard for the economic factor in the historiography of the dispute. On one hand, this is perhaps deliberate as historical narratives of the matter sought to achieve political objectives to the extent that they supported or refuted, as the case may be, competing claims to the territory. On the other hand, this oversight, if it can be called that, is perhaps a function of the way in which traditional uh, uh, diplomacy was uh, studied. That emphasized the political over the economic. Recent shifts in the economic in the concept of economic diplomacy, however, um, reveal that the spheres are connected. If that is true, then Britain's stance towards the Logwood settlement of Belize in British Honduras and its handling of the territorial claim must be understood within that wider context of its colonial objectives and of its policies towards Spanish America. The extant body of literature on this matter for strongly suggest that this was aimed at strategically securing territorial positions in the Americas and West Indies that would allow Britain to gain footholds from which it could break open the markets in Spain's colonial empire. To better understand the context for uh, Britain's stance towards the Lagwood settlement at Belize, it is necessary to go back to the period shortly after Columbus's discovery of the New World when Catholic Pope Alexander the issued a papal bull, the Inter Caetaria, granting Spain sovereignty to all lands discovered and yet undiscovered, and forbidding all persons from approaching the New World for commerce or for other purposes. To help achieve this objective, Spain declared a closed seas policy in the South Sea, or what we know today as the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean Sea, and enacted a series of laws prohibiting any ships from navigating these areas. Spain's objective was preventing um, competition with its Spanish merchants from Cadiz and Seville in its colonial market. These measures effectively excluded other European powers from trading legally with Spanish American territory. Their response to this prohibition was to challenge the monopoly of trade by attacking Spanish commerce and by seeking their own footholds in the New World. In the case of England, though, they never recognized the simple donations. And when its merchants complained to Parliament about being excluded from engaging in trade and commerce in these lucrative markets, Britain insisted that the Pope had no authority to give the peculiar navigation of any sea to the Spaniards or to Portugal. Which leads me to the matter of England's response. Well, I know the Belgian's response was, could be uh, something must be wrong with that Pope. How could he be giving away the lands like that? So, English agitations against the Spanish monopoly of trade with the colonies in America took on increased prominence under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. And it was under her that the first claims to English positions in the New World were laid. During her reign, relations between England and Spain soured. And when in 1568, uh, Queen Elizabeth seized several Spanish ships laden with bullion that had been blown off force into English waters, the Spanish crown retaliated by seizing British merchant ships docked in Spanish ports and confiscating their cargoes. In response to, to the cry of English merchants against Spain's action, uh, Queen Elizabeth issued letters of reprisals which saw thousands of English privateers sail and plunder Spanish shipping in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Elizabeth's policies towards Spain's colonial imperial holdings were swayed by the attitudes of her close advisors and different colonial and public figures. Her chief advisor was Secretary of State Robert Cecil, who was first Earl of Salisbury, and who was also closely connected with leading men in England with vested interest in securing large commercial concessions in the Spanish Empire. Many of Cecil's cohorts vigorously advocated anti-Spanish policies and held that any condition of peace with Spain had to involve access to the Spanish Indies. And they were some of the leading financial backers of ventures, including privateering enterprises to the Americas. Sir Cecil was also close to uh, Robert ha uh, Hackloyd, who happened to be the chap uh, his chaplain. And Hakluyt encouraged the queen at one point to distress the Spanish king in the, in the Indies, the apple of his eye, by taking away his treasure, which he had out in the West Indies, and his power and strength would be diminished. Hakluyt told the queen that she had every right to possess uh, Spain's lands and claimed that it would provide greatly enhanced uh, uh, revenues for the crown. In the end, it seemed that Hakluyt was able to convince the queen that there were profits uh, to be had for English merchants and for the English crown to be enriched from the wares in America. Another of her counselors was a man named Francis Walsingham, 
who was appointed English ambassador to France in 1570. While Singham harbored strong anti-Spanish sentiment and was linked to men in England who were intent on unleashing as many commerce raiders as, uh, as they could muster uh, to prey on Spanish shipping, and also in establishing bases in the New World from which they could attack Spain uh, and its commerce. Elizabeth repeated support for eight English pirates and her tacit investments in, in piracy activities suggest that on various counts she favored Walsingham's uh, encouragement. In 1587, um, the Spanish ambassador to London complained to Elizabeth uh, about the depredations of British pirates and privateers on Spanish shipping in America. And the Queen countered that the Spaniards, by their hard deadline with the English, uh, whom they had pro prohibited uh, commerce contrary to the laws of nations, and moreover, she understood not why her or any of her prince's subjects should be debarred from trade in India. In other words, as the Belizean Creoles would say, you see, that you make a have to hurt you. Motivated by the potential for trade which the Indies presented, English merchants by the first quarter of the 1600s had begun enjoying handsome returns from speculating on pir uh, piracy activities in the Indies, with some even claiming that they felt encouraged to explore to those other parts. One such merchant was Robert Rich, the second Earl of Warwick, and for him, piracy was simply commercial speculation, and the Indies provided the biggest gamble. Rich was granted a charter to set up the Providence Island Company, which operated out of Santa Catalina Island, just off the coast of Nicaragua. And from here, his company commissioned many privateering ventures. The pirates or buccaneers, as they were referred to, habitually sought out settlements in the New World to serve as bases of operation. And it was through this that Belize became recognized for its practicality as a place from which pirates could cover, could take cover, and also launch attacks on shipping. Our history books tell us that the first settlement was established by a pirate named the Wallace, and that Belize got its name from a corruption of the pronunciation of Wallace. Well, let me throw water on that invention once and for all. Peter Wallace never existed, except in the imagination of the English who were intent on spinning an imperial story to subordinate, to substantiate their claims of effective occupation. Which brings me to the matter of Logwood. It was one of, on one of these privateering ventures in the Caribbean that the realization was made by the pirates um, after they had attacked Spanish shipping that logwood uh, was a profitable commodity and at one point sold for as much as 100 pounds per ton back in England and Europe. This sort of coincided with revival of uh, English interest in logwood as a result of growth in their trade in woolen cloths and textiles. Dyes extracted from logwood, which had first been introduced into the English cloth industry uh, about 50 or 60 years earlier. Um, but the unskilled lake dryers of, uh, of the time found that it, it would yield a fugitive color. They couldn't get it to stick. And so in 1581 and again in 1597, um, Lagood was prohibited from use by Acts of Parliament. In another 50 years or so, the art for fixing the colors to become improved had become improved, and thereafter the dye stuff gained widespread use in the English uh, cloth industry. Following the improvements in fixing um, the dye to cloth, a trade in logwood from Campeche in the Yucatan area of, Spain, of New Spain, what we know as today Mexico, developed. And of course, this was soon recognized that Belize had some of the best logwood around. Thomas Modiford, who was then governor of Jamaica, recognized the economic importance of logwood and mused over the financial benefits it could yield to the English crown. Modiford uh, was an advisor to the king, and the king listened to his counsel. Uh, on matters related to the Caribbean. Muddy Ford's successor as governor of Jamaica, Sir Thomas Lynch, also realized the potential profitability of Logwood for England. And he imagined um, that it could serve as a storehouse for all of Europe, which may be worth 100,000 pounds per annum to the trade and customs. And today's money that's several uh, tens of millions of dollars. In 1670, Governor Muddy Ford related to Lord Arlington that the logwood trade involved privateers, but he was quick to point out that they only cut in places either uh, un inhabited by Indians or avoid and trespass not at all upon the Spaniards. And if encouraged, the whole logwood trade would be very English and could be very uh, could return considerable monies to, to the crown. The assertion that logwood was only cut 
um, and that settlements only established in places uninhabited is key to understanding Britain's claim of dominion uh, and forms part of an imperial ideology de deployed by the English crown. What was formulated by persons with individual, in other words, commercial and trade interests in Spanish America and the West Indies. The ideology advanced the legal argument of res nullius, a way of justifying colonial acquisition of territory based on concepts of natural law, which held that any territory that was empty had no owner or legal sovereign. Although Spain, uh, by virtue of its papal donation, had already claimed all territories in the Americas, Inglis, England went ahead and used the res nullius argument to claim its settlement in Yucatan. It did so by perverting the concept, arguing that English settlers, in other words, the buccaneers, by virtue of their logwood activities, effectively occupied areas of land that were deserted, void, or otherwise uninhabited. This way of interpreting the res nullius argument reflected the orientation of leading merchants and political figures in England at the time who were also councillors and fellows of the Royal Society. Um, and it hinges on commercial precepts. So what they did was they used theological interpretations of uninhabited, which mandated that such lands be possessed in order to be improved. In other words, they went back to the Bible and using teachings on the Protestant and Calvinist uh, um, uh, religions, um, corroborated these with scientific rationality. Uh, and these men, many of who had personal interest in the logwood trade, as well as other areas of commerce in the Americas, strongly advocated English settlement of Spain's colonial territories in the Yucatan. By their rationalization, this allowed for the commercial and industrial potential of the land to be realized and hence to be improved. Understood this way, the ecumenical notion of improvement manifested commercial intentions and suggests that England's clamor for the right to cut logwood were really attempts aimed at strategically breaking into Spain's monopoly of trade in logwood by turning it into an English commodity and thus increasing its value, and that the logwood settlements provided the foothold, foothold for this uh, to happen. When the Spanish comprehended that England only seemed interested in claiming the right to cut logwood in areas where it could establish and carry on illicit trade with Spanish colonies, uh, the Queen of Spain in 1672 issued a royal cedula declaring uh, such to be pirates who would make an invasion of trade without license in the ports of the Indies. In other words, anybody who, was, who did not have a license to trade or to be in, in the Indies and had invaded Spain's territories was considered to be pirates. From that point onward, and you look at the history of belief from about 1670, 1672 onwards, Spain began to dispute the rights to the, to the liberty of cutting logwood, which the English cutters, logwood cutters had enjoyed uh, previously. The problem for Spain was, though, was that the die was already cast. Uh, all that England needed to do was to establish or prove that the Spaniards had never established themselves along the eastern coast of the Yucatan, and more particularly that they had never established themselves in the Lagwood camps in Belize, which they never did. Over the course of the next century or more, England would continue to pry open Spain's colonial markets in Spanish America using treaties of trade, commerce, and navigation. So it's interesting when you look at the history of the, uh, of the dispute. Every treaty that is relevant to dispute are treaties that were used to settle other matters of dispute between England and Spain. But in all of them, um, there were segments that spoke trade and commerce, and it was under that uh, uh, segment that matters related to the wood cutting and to the settlement that Belize was dealt with. The predominant historical interpretation and thinking towards the territorial dispute over Belize suggests motivations of formal empire and emphasize state centrality in explaining Britain's colonial policy towards us. This research, my research, challenges these long-standing assumptions. The preliminary research uh, that I have conducted reveals that it was, uh, it was key English merchants and colonial imperial figures and not the state that played a central role in influencing Britain's policies towards the settlement at Belize. These merchants were interested in commerce and trade and not territory per se. However, they did understand that possession of territory was crucial for obtaining their economic objectives. By eliminating how the figures leveraged their political and public connections to further their private overseas commercial and trade interests, I believe it's possible to clarify how they shaped Britain's policies towards Belize. 
and why Britain handled territorial disputes during this period on the study the way it did. Unfortunately, um, time does not permit further treaties today. Um, but the presentation has dealt with the periods of the dispute in the 17th and 17th, uh, 18th centuries show that it was not the state and, and private entrepreneurs who, who kind of directed uh, how England articulated its policies. The archival uh, sources consulted so far suggest that this pattern continued through the 19th and 20th centuries, and, uh, and particularly between 18 and, and 20 and 1870. English merchants had a strong interest in the commerce and trade of Central America, in particular after they had declared independence from Spain. And then again, uh, English merchants and businessmen had a uh, strong interest in investments in the construction of a transitional canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. These were all key to, the, to how Britain uh, handled the matter of the territorial dispute over Belize. We will have to wait, though, to, for another seminar to hear more about the detailed research findings for these other two periods. In closing, I thought it rather curious that in different acts of parliament passed by the British government um, in 1817 and again in 1819, um, where it admitted that Belize is not within the territory and dominion of His Majesty, but rather was merely a settlement for certain purposes in the possession and under the protection of His Majesty. I'm always wondering, what really did they mean by that? What was our purpose? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David Gomez. Uh, we're going to take your questions at the end of the three presentations. So kindly okay. jot down your questions, have them, and we'll take your questions at the end. Um, now we turn to Ambassador David Gibson's presentation entitled, Key Considerations for a Judicial Resolution of the Belize-Guatemala Territorial Dispute by the International Court of Justice. Ambassador Gibson. Good morning. Um, interesting comment by David Gomez that should be mentioned is that in 1848, uh, the United Kingdom and Guatemala signed a treaty of uh, commerce and navigation consistent with what happened in the past with Spain. However, what I plan to do today is to look at, uh, we're going forward quite a bit, um, to look at key considerations for a juridical resolution of the Belize-Guatemala territorial dispute by the International Court of Justice. And in doing so, I want to examine uh, or quickly go through a, a, a series of terminologies that would help to uh, create the sort of uh, disciplinary or multidisciplinary framework for analyzing and understanding uh, why this dispute has reached the stage of juridical treatment. And I use the word juridical because it reflects a legal uh, perspective of which I can identify three. One of them being uh, the actual judicial, and I'm referring um, to the International Court of Justice, its judicial function, its advisory jurisdiction, and under its ju judicial function, there's legal and non-legal aspects of how uh, the court functions. You'll find out that Belize has um, been able to place itself to have this long-standing issue looked at via Article 38.1 of the court statute, which looks, which looks at strictly legal matters under international law and not along the line of what Guatemala would have wanted. 
So what is international law? It is a set of rules generally regarded and accepted as law, binding relations between states and international organizations. It's a framework for the practice of stable, organized relations between states. States are not obliged to abide by, to abide by international law. So um, on to the other slide, uh, here we go, recognize sources of international law. And the sources of international law can include treaties, customary international law, what is known as customary international law, general principles of law, and it is how international law is defined in its law of sources. International law is the most authoritative statement, the, or the most authoritative statement of international law is Article 381 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. Customary international law is an aspect of international law involving the principle of custom, drawing from a general and consistent practice of states that they follow from a sense of legal obligation. It is held by the International Court of Justice, by jurists, by the United Nations, and its member states to be among the primary sources of international law. What is international treaty law? And we have what is called the Vienna Convention of the law, on the Law of Treaties of 1969, which is the main instrument that regulates treaties, and it defines a treaty and relates to how treaties are made, amended, interpreted, how they operate, and are terminated. This would be very important for Belize if this matter were to go to adjudication. What is a treaty? A generic term for an international agreement between sovereign states considered binding under international law, unless otherwise agreed. That is a picture. Uh, of the covering of our 1859 Boundary Convention. Now, what is a Boundary Convention or Boundary Treaty? And that is a political or juridical instrument signed between two or more countries establishing their territorial limits, the boundaries. An abiding principle of treaty law adhered to by the International Court of Justice is that a boundary once established by treaty, achieves a permanence which a treaty itself does not enjoy. Such treaty can cease to be in force without in any way affecting the boundary. Boundary limitation. Now this is in the boundary making process that we are looking at. The process in boundary treaty making by which two sovereign parties or states establish and describe in writing the location of their common boundary mainly as the output of decision making at the negotiating table. This forms the nucleus and material part of a boundary treaty. You notice me in here that the 1859 UK Guatemala Boundary Convention is a boundary limitation treaty. Now, the next step, the next, uh, the next step um, in boundary making is the process for boundary demarcation. And this is a uh, field operation to mark the position of the boundary on the ground so it is visible to all. It involves the formation of a joint commission of equal numbers by the parties, surveyors usually, 
um, land surveyors, geodetic surveyors, sometimes accompanied by a neutral arbiter. Sometimes countries might agree to have a neutral professional surveyor to look at their work if there are differences um, as they mark the line. Um, so this is a, a neutral arbiter who surveys uh, the, the limited line. The, the, the commissioners do this and as the initial stage of demarcation. Okay. The objective of demarcation is to place or adopt physical marks that accurately represent the location of a delimited boundary using physical markers, etc., monuments uh, placed directly on the boundary line, which is paired where necessary. Physical markers were placed at Gracias a Dios and Garbas Falls in 1860. That is in implementing the 1859 Boundary Convention. Permanent anchor pillars were erected at sites, at, the same, at these same sites of physical markers in 1925, and they were surveyed between 1931 and 1934. I'm bringing these is because these are indicators or evidentiary indicators of the implementation of a boundary convention. So, oh, here we are, these are commissioners um, in Guatemala and uh, British and British Hondurans who in uh, 1929 established the permanent marker, replacing the one placed there by British and Guatemalan surveyors in 1860. Um, here is the permanent marker that's there now, still there. Okay, what are land boundaries? There are two types of land boundaries, natural boundaries and geometric or the, the made famous artificial boundaries. Um, natural boundaries include waterways, dry courses, mountain ranges, and other useful natural, uh, other, yeah, other useful natural uh, landmarks like the Sarstood River is a natural boundary. Geometric and artificial boundaries are marked by various forms of man-made monuments. For example, Grassas Adios, Robert's Falls, have uh, terminal or anchor markers. Uh, this is a um, this is the uh, Grassas Adios monument. This was in the uh, year 2000 when a group from the Pan American Institute of Geography and History did a satellite-based uh, geodetic survey and found that the location of these markers were remarkably uh, very much accurate in their location. Key elements in the history of the dispute, and I will quickly, of course, it was in 1859, signature and ratification of the Boundary Convention, signature on 30th of April, ratification by the United Kingdom on 12th of April, the treaty came into the force came into force thereafter. In 1863, there was a signature of an 1863 convention to uh, clarify and uh, to clarify the matter of road con uh, construction obligations of the parties. A dispute had arisen because of clause in the convention on the joint, uh, conjoint construction of a road and there was a dispute as to who should pay for what. It was settled by this convention but it is it, was, uh, it actually uh, failed in its implementation uh, because Guatemala failed to ratify the treaty. That will be very critical for any future judicial review. 1884, this is a critical year again, British refusal to reactivate the lapsed 1863 convention results in Guatemala calling for arbitration for return of its, the land it had ceded. In other words, Guatemala is saying that the signature of that boundary convention and the inclusion of that clause for the conjoint uh, construction of a road uh, was that the road itself was payment for land that uh, Britain had received. Um, and that's, of course, from the Tibun to the Sarastun. That has been the essence of Guatemala's argument ever since then. 1937, I fast forward to 1937, bearing in mind that in 1929, there was actually surveyors on the ground, 70 years after, they had gone on the ground again, a new administration, and done, uh, established the permanent markers, as well as in, in, implemented a survey uh, between 1931 and 1934, 
um, which uh, established a 20 uh, foot wide line between Gracias a Dios and uh, Garbos Falls. By 1927, when the second segment of that road was to be, uh, of that uh, border was to be uh, surveyed, Guatemala called again for Britain to fulfill the obligation of road construction. Britain declined, so Brit Guatemala in 1937 calls for US President, that was Roosevelt at the time, to mediate the dispute. It was declined by the British who said the matter should be adjudicated by the Permanent Court of International Justice. Uh, but Guatemala, uh, it refuses Guatemala's request for the matter to be heard ex equio et bono. It is a term you would have been hearing quite a bit because that is the legal position or the legal position taken by Guatemala for many years until it relinquished it in 2008. Uh, the British uh, refused to go along that line because it was not strictly legal. It had to do with grievances and other things that could be introduced of a non-legal nature, um, which as it later turned out had no substance in any case. Now, uh, 1948, and this is the time of the formation of the new International Court of Justice. The United Kingdom invites Guatemala to submit uh, a case to the international the case to the International Court of Justice under Article 38.1 of the Court Statute. Guatemala refuses because they are sticking to this 38.2, Article 38.2, which is the ex equio et bono uh, article. In 1962, failed dispute resolution negotiations. Uh, this is the first time that Belize is becoming involved, meaning Belizean politicians becoming involved in negotiations with the United Kingdom and Guatemala. Um, and this was held in, uh, in Puerto Rico in 1962. 1968, Belize rejects uh, a US mediator's proposal which places sovereignty and defense under Guatemalan control. So, so you have negotiation, you have, neg and you have mediation, an attempt at mediation. And all these are things listed in the United Nations uh, and the, um, Charter under the Pacific Settlement of Disputes, the processes involved in dispute resolution. You try negotiation, mediation, and you'll see that we've been through all of that um, exhaustively uh, without resolution. Um, in, uh, so from 1968 to 1978, failed negotiations with Belize refusing to yield territory. And that refusal to yield territory was not only from Guatemalan pressure, but also British pressure, because there was a stage when the British tried to push uh, the Belize government to yield land in the south, from the Mohodong and various and variations of that. So uh, our negotiations and our government received pressure, the pressure of Guatemala and the pressure of Britain to yield territory. That's interesting to note and to be kept in mind. In 1980, UN supports Belize's independence with UK defense guarantee. So by 1980, our diplomats had achieved, the, had accomplished the remarkable achievement of internationalization, support from the United Nations General Assembly, which included a defense guarantee from the British who had hitherto not wanted to do so. It is telling you something about the effectiveness of diplomacy, which we may need to rely upon sometime in the future, depending on the outcome of the referendum. So, uh, 1981, we had the famous heads of agreement rejected by Belize. Belize proceeded to independence. Can do another? Yeah. Uh, key elements again, 1981 to 1991. Oh, you have tripartite, this is in the post independence period, tripartite negotiations between Belize, Guatemala, United Kingdom. And during this time, in 19. 91, Guatemala recognized Belize's independence, but not, did not recognize the geopolitical space of Belize as, as we defined in our constitution based on the 1859 treaty. Uh, in 1992, Belize passes the Maritime Areas Act enabling negotiation of under the, uh, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, enabling this kind of uh, negotiation to occur with Guatemala. In other words, the quid pro quo for Guatemala's 
the Convention of Our Independence was for the settlement of the issue to be negotiated in the sea, um, based on the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And that's, people will recall the Maritime Areas Act, which has come up for attention again, where Belize reserved its uh, right to a 12 mile territorial sea in that area adjacent to the Guatemalan coastline, um, opposite the, the Venezuelan um, coastline, to see whether something could be negotiated that would enable Guatemala to have access to territorial sea, bearing in mind that that's, there's a certain point where Guatemala is blocked by Belize's territorial sea and Honduras's territorial sea from accessing the high seas. So, uh, 2000, 200, 2002, we have the Rampler Reichler facilitation proposal, which Guatemala's foreign minister accepted. He was persuaded that they had no arguments to substantiate their claim. And so he agreed to these proposals, which would have recognized the boundaries and would have settled uh, the maritime areas. Um, those were rejected by the Guatemalan Congress. So this is, again, a new aspect. This is facilitation. We have mediation, facilitation. Um, uh, negotiation, continuous negotiations, all of these aspects of PT uh, or resol uh, uh, dispute resolution being tried. Um, so by 2008, Guatemala and Belize, after a final round of negotiation, agree uh, and authorize the Secretary General of the Organization of American States under which this process um, was being handled uh, to, if, if, if negotiations failed, to make recommendation for a legal settlement of the matter. In fact, then the, uh, the OAS Secretary General uh, recommended in 2007, November 19, 2007, that this matter, uh, having not been resolved by these various other mechanisms, mechanisms be placed with the uh, International Court of Justice. Okay. Okay, and this is a quick thing. Uh, with respect to the resolution of boundary and territorial disputes, the United Nations Charter, um, Article, Chapter 6, Article 33, 1 and 2, very important to bear in mind, it says that the parties to any dispute, the continuance of which is likely to engage the maintenance of international peace and security, shall first of all seek a solution by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation or facilitation, arbitration, judicial settlement, a resort to legal regional agencies, as we have done in the case of the Organization of American States, or arrangements, or other peaceful means of their own choice. The Security Council shall, when it deems it necessary, call upon the parties to settle their disputes by such means. There are times when these disputes flare up and so on, and uh, the Security Council is the agency that comes in to uh, make the peace or to defuse uh, conflict. In our case, we have used the uh, Organization of American States, bearing in mind uh, that the Organization of American States is an agency of the United Nations. It's a regional representative, like the African Union, it is a regional representative of the United Nations. Uh, United Nations. Now, this matter of, uh, there's a typology of, of um, disputes. And um, you will see that there are four types. Belligerent, hostile, managed, and dormant disputes. And very quickly, we've experienced all these forms of disputes. Full military mobilization uh, for invasion of Belize by Guatemala occurred in 1948, 1958, 1973, involving El Salvador, and in 1977. We've had the hostile aspects of a, deuce, of a dispute involving the use and threat of force. In 1999, there was a seizing of our Belize security personnel, um, which led to the, the claiming there were no borders. Um, but it was to heighten um, awareness and get the process going again of trying to resolve the, not, not trying to resolve the, the dispute in their way. And this is where the agreements in confidence building measures were finally agreed with the Organization of 
American states. So negotiations continued. I also list the 2015 um, incursions um, and actions by Guatemala as, a, as elements of a hostile dispute, um, which has resulted in the destabilization of the Starstone River. It is still in a state of uh, um, destabilization, which means that Guatemala's diplomatic objective has been accomplished um, for the time that we are engaged. Um, simultaneous, simultaneously along with this hostile dispute comes the fact that since 2001 under the OAS, we are in the farm uh, involved in a managed dispute. Managed because we have a third party, uh, the OAS, we have these agreements on confidence building measures, we had the facilitation process, we had the transition process from 2003 to 2005, and the final the negotiation and judicial phase within which we are now engaged. So it can be said that we are involved in a managed dispute. There have been flare-ups. The SARS-2 is a hostile act and should be regarded as such. That has happened within the framework of a managed dispute. And we have what are called de dormant disputes. And I will say that there is one in existence between Belize and Honduras with regard to the Sopalela Keys. Although for some years now, Honduras has, although it is in their constitution that the Cayos Sopatios are part of Honduras, Honduras has not pressed its claim. And as a matter of fact, has cooperated with Belize in the matter of establishing uh, a, a channel a way for Guatemala to pass through our territorial seas. They had agreed to that in 2000 when we um, were in the facilitation process involving regular Ramphal. So, can we go ahead, please? All right. All right, now what I've put here is the description of the boundary with Guatemala, which is the same description that you'll find in Schedule 1 of our constitution. And it says, beginning at the mouth of the river Sarstoon in the Bay of Honduras and proceeding through the mid-channel thereof, the Grasas of Dios Falls, then running, then turning to the right and continuing by a line drawn direct from Grasas of Dios Falls to Garbas Falls on the river Belize and from Garbas Falls due north until it strikes the Mexican frontier. Okay, please. Okay, what we see here is the Sarsun River, and you see that yellow line is the mid-channel as, as set out in the treaty. That is the deepest part of the Sarsun River, which the parties agreed in 1859 would be uh, the boundary between uh, Belize and Guatemala. That area to the north, what is the north channel? constitutes what is called Belize's internal waters, which leads to anything that, any waterway that exists within the area um, inside the range of keys. I'll explain a bit more. Go ahead. Okay, Article 6 of the Boundary Convention. I'm just putting some, I'm not citing all the articles of the convention, that's the critical ones. And as you saw from the Sassoon River uh, uh, pictorial that I presented just now, here is Article 6, which says it establishes a channel in the waterline of the Sassoon River to be free and open to vessels and boats of both parties and islands therein to belong to, to the party on whose side of the navigable channel it is located. So this is basically saying that the Sarstone Island is for Belize. And it is saying that there should be unimpeded travel. In other words, with a river, you don't know when you're in the middle. Currents are there. And so it, the idea was to have free navigation. And so it existed all that time until more recently, starting in 2007, when the Guatemala started to try to assert themselves and successfully did so by 2015, creating the situation of instability. Okay. No, uh, oh, sorry. I think I missed uh, something. There was this Article 7 is really the bone of contention because there's mutual agreement to conjointly 
use best efforts to establish the easiest means of communication between uh, Guatemala City and the Atlantic Coast. You conjoint best efforts between Guatemala. It's not something where the British had agreed to build this road. It, the two parties should have built it. They signed this uh, convention in 1863 where the British would have divided up uh, 50,000 pounds, etc. Two minutes. My goodness. Let's go ahead quickly then. So, uh, uh, these are maps that were attached to the 1859 Boundary Convention. Let's go ahead, please. Uh, boundary segments. This is showing you um, the lengths of the boundary. Sarah 25 miles. Um, Grassa Sodioso Garbage Falls, 85 miles. Um, uh, Garbage Falls to the Mexican frontier is another 55 miles. Go ahead. Um, maritime boundaries. I will show you what these are. Could we go ahead? Uh, here we are. So, what you're seeing here, the lighter blue is what is called internal waters. The outer part is the territorial sea. And beyond that is our 200 miles exclusive economic zone. Go ahead. That's another depiction of it. Go ahead again. Go ahead. This is just showing you the location. Ah, no. This is what Guatemala is claiming as they projected in their Consulta Popular. Um, which is uh, quite a bit of land, right up to the Western Highway. Um, next one. This is more accurately reflecting the claim, which is the Sea Sibun, Sibun River going south of the Sarstun. Next slide. This is the outcome of their referendum, and it shows that uh, um, twenty-six percent of the voters voted. 90% of that 26% uh, voted yes. The rest, um, there, there was an abstention of over 75% of voters. Go ahead, please. All right. And this is a referendum question. The referendum question Do you agree that any legal claim of Guatemala against Belize relating to land and insular territories and to any maritime areas pertaining to these territories should be submitted to the International Court of Justice? For final assessment, and it determined it determine finally the boundaries of the respective territories and areas of the parties. Next, next slide. All right, and this is here where the parties are requesting the court to determine this in accordance with applicable applicable rules of international law, so as specified in Article 38.1 of the Statute of the Court. Any and all legal claims. Let's do an analysis of that uh, question. Any and all legal claims means any issue that relates to the uh, that, 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 re that re relates to the question for legal review under Section 38.1. Declaring the rights uh, would relate to any rights prescribed by international law that we're entitled to. These rights should be prescribed, self-determination to independence, sovereignty, equality, and so on. Determine the boundaries of the respective states, this could only be consistent with the 1859 Boundary Treaty, the description therein. Go ahead, please. And the key points of our position, international treaty law, validation of the 1859 treaty. We have arguments that will show that it is Guatemala that is in breach of the treaty by repudiating it, by rejecting it. Um, we will also have arguments to show that we would also have argued to show on what is called acquisitive prescription evidence of effective uninterrupted occupation, historical consolidation evidence of administration of the area, and very importantly, a right to self-determination. Guatemala's arguments have to do with they inherited this land from Spain under what is called Uti Procedetis, and that they uh, the 1859 treaty was breached by the British. They have no other legal argument that they can place. They will bring other things, of course, that are extraneous and not legal, and we can expect them to bring in the kitchen sink when they put their case um, to the court if it, if it goes there. Go ahead. And um, oh, I just did this to show what could be a possible, or well, let's go to the declarations. What we would expect that the treaty would be validated, that is a valid treaty, that we enjoy full sovereignty of the area 
uh, east of the line, that Guatemala enjoys full sovereignty of the area west of the line, and that we are obligations, uh, we are under international obligation to respect each other's sovereignty. This is the kind of thing that a court declaration would come, around, come along with. That's our expectation. This area has to do with the sea. How do we settle that? And that is really looking at the fact that Guatemala, in that juncture there, needs access to the high seas. And this is reflecting what Belize and Honduras was prepared to do, or prepared to do, to allow Guatemala that access to territorial sea, exclusive economic zone going out to the sea, or to the high seas. Um, the pro and con of going to the ICJ, in fact, Belize, uh, confirmation of Belize's state rights under international law and validation by the ICJ of the 1859 Boundary Convention with resulting corroboration of Belize's boundary with Guatemala based thereon. Uh, uh, and it will eliminate any basis for Guatemala's territorial claim. What, what is the con? Guatemala may resist and object to the court's ruling and may, be, and may refuse to comply. Um, Guatemala may attempt to resort to the use of force and threat of force. We have to expect these things. However, if we look at the next slide, the track record of the, of the, uh, yeah, okay. But I just basically want to say that the track record of the um, ICJ in terms of compliance with judgment has been one in which all contentious territorial disputes have been, that have been judged, have been complied with. Some states have been reluctant, they are angry because they think they've lost something. Well, none of them have had to be referred to the United Nations Security Council, which is really the enforcement arm of the International Court of Justice. I'll leave it here. I would want to say that this is really a presentation that needs four to five minutes um, to be fully, because there are other dimensions to it. Like, for example, if the people vote no uh, to go into the ICJ, then what next? Um, will the British be angry? Will the international community be angry? Not really. We have got to be organized diplomatically to deal with that and look at the other dimension of what the court does, which is the advisory opinion, which can look directly at the 1859 Boundary Convention and determine its validity. And if that is determined to be valid, then Guatemala's argument falls away. It's then for us to move diplomatically in the framework of the United Nations General Assembly to get Guatemala to comply with the marking of the border and to respect our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, we now move on to our third and final presentation. Um, Mr. Clark's presentation is entitled A Comparative Analysis of the Belize Guatemala Dispute and Three ICJ Cases. Track record Cambodia versus Thailand, El Salvador versus Honduras, and Libya versus Chad. Mr. Clark. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Carl. Uh, being conscious of the time constraints, I may only present on two cases. So please bear with me. All right, so before getting into the cases, um, I wish to speak briefly on through, um, three patriotic uh, Belizeans, you know, that have passed on, but have made significant contributions uh, to Belize's cause in its um, territorial dispute with Guatemala. And it's good to reflect and show appreciation and respect where it's due. Now, not even one square centimeter. You would be surprised to know that there are even senior government officials that don't know where this um, very famous um, statement comes from. It actually comes um, from my father, the late Ronald Clark. He was a career civil servant. Yeah. And he first drafted the, um, he drafted the first version of the historic appointment with history speech. That was in 1962. 
which was later delivered by the Right Hon Honorable George Price, the late. And this is documented in the late Rudolf Castillo's book, Profile of the Right Honorable George Price, one of the people. Next here we have the Right Honorable George Price, who is uh, considered to be the father of the nation. He's a person that led us to political independence September 21st, 1981, with our, sovereign, so with our sovereignty and territory intact. And I would like to note that under very difficult circumstances, um, nationally and internationally, I won't go into details. Um, next, we have here the Honorable Philip Olson, late. Um, who can be considered the father of democracy in, um, in Belize. As you know, he was a founding member of two of the major political parties and very active in the opposition. And he was someone that kept Belizeans informed developments regarding to this dispute and also mobilized protests against government when they felt that the government wasn't doing the will of the people. And one of his uh, most famous quotes is, the time to save your country is before you lose it. I would say that um, we have secured um, political independence, but the struggle continues um, to do away with this unfounded claim by Guatemala. Uh, my question to you today is, what will this generation do to deal with this claim? And um, as you know, on April 10, 2019, we have another appointment with history. So let's see how that goes. The first case um, that I'll speak on is the Cambodia versus Thailand, the, known as the Temple of Prayer Vihar, 1962. Um, can anyone tell me on, on which side of the border the temple is by looking at the um, map there? It's not so easy to tell, but uh, we'll look into it. Initially, the, the parties to the dispute were France for Cambodia, the Kingdom of Siam for Thailand. And in February 13, 1904, they concluded a boundary treaty that later became contentious. And Siam changed its name to Thailand in 1949. Cambodia attained independence in 1953, inheriting the dispute. And as you know, in our case, the original parties that dispute for Spain for, for Guatemala and the United Kingdom for Belize. This is a, a picture of the temple. It's an ancient Hindu temple with um, significant value in terms of archaeology and religion and things like that. And it's it is right on the border. Um, now, Thailand claimed that the edge of the escarpment, which is a cliff, uh, was a natural and obvious line for the frontier in that region, and they provided documentary evidence of the party's desire to establish frontiers that were natural, visible, and unshakable, or unmistakable. And so, Cam Cambodia submitted an application to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, on October the 6th, 1959, to adjudicate. And then in 1961, the court upheld its jurisdiction. And the court said that the dispute was really a difference view regarding the sovereignty of the region of the temple. In contrast, in our case, we have um, a special agreement which was signed uh, between Belize and Guatemala um, December the 8th, 2008. Now, the 1904 treaty, um, the interesting articles here are Article 1, which defines the frontier, and Article 3, which delimits the frontier. And this was supposed to be undertaken by mixed commissions, duly appointed by the parties. And Articles 1 and 3 of this 1904 treaty are virtually identical to Articles 1 and 3 of the 1859 treaty between Belize and Guatemala in terms of subject matter. Um, but there's an important distinction, and that is that in our case, we have 
a frontier that runs along fixed points in a straight line. And in the latter case, the parties agreed to a watershed line. And so if, if you look at this here, um, you can see that um, all of this area looks the same. And it, it, would, it would appear to be in Thailand, right? But um, if you look closely, this um, yellow line here is actually the watershed line, which would mean that um, you know, this side would fall in Cambodia, and you know, clearly um, the temple wouldn't be in Thailand then. So now we have the answer to the question that I asked earlier. Now in 1907, there were some important maps. Um, the Thai government, they didn't have the technical expertise to prepare these maps, and so they requested French topographical um, officers to prepare these maps. And uh, the French government um, complied with this request and produced um, a series of 11 maps, which were published by H. Barrera, reputable cartographical firm at the time. All right, so, so the, um, the French government communicated these 11 maps to the Thai government. And what happened was that three of these 11 maps were affected by the 1907 treaty, so that former areas, including the temple, which were previously in Thailand, were now wholly in Cambodia. Okay, so it was on the strength of the validity of the 1907 maps that Cambodia derived her claim of sovereignty over the temple. Um, the court decided nine votes to three in favor of the frontier as indicated by the map as a matter of treaty interpretation. And the frontier considered, it was considered to be the result of the limitation undertaken by the mixed commission. Uh, similarly, in the Guatemala-Belize dispute, Commissioners were appointed in 1861 and 1929 to establish the boundary marks defined in the treaty. This is just a map showing you know, the, the boundary markers as they exist even today. Now, um, Thailand's denial of the um, binding character of the, the map was based on its argument that it did not accept the map that showed the temple in Cambodia. It saw it as an error. And further, it said that this um, error was not sufficient to affect sovereignty over the temple area. But the court disagreed with this view completely. It reasoned that since the maps were requested by the Thai authorities, it was thus invested with an official standing. And it also found that Thailand must be held to have acquiesced due to its failure to react within reasonable time when the circumstances clearly required some reaction signaling disagreement. And in our case now, um, it is Guatemala who has failed to react within a reasonable time to re repudiate the 1859 treaty. As you know, they only did this um, as recent as 1946. This is some 87 years later. Um, this gentleman here is um, Henry Ray, who was one of the boundary um, commissioners. I was trying to find a picture of the Guatemalan boundary commissioner, but I wasn't able to do that. So. And here, um, as you can see, these are the, the physical um, border markers that you can actually go and visit yourself if you wish. And there's one Aguas Turbias, the other one Garbots Fall, and the other one um, Gracias a Dios. Now, some of the key points um, coming out of this Temple of Priya Vihar case is that um, when states establish a frontier, one of the primary objects is to achieve stability and finality. Furthermore, one of the fundamental legal principles that can be also applied to the Guatemala Belize dispute is that once agreed boundary stands for any other approach would vitiate the fundamental principle of the stability of boundaries. And this goes to the root of the Westphalia state system, and it's equally applicable in the Temple of Priyar case, 
Eritrea VR case, and also to the Belize Guatemala dispute. Now, moving on to the next case, El Salvador, Honduras, 1992. This was initiated by a special agreement by the parties in uh, May 24th, 1986, which is comparable to our own special agreement. Article two of the special agreement um, said that the dispute was the delimitation of the frontier, which was not specified in Article 16 of the General Peace Treaty, 1980. And so, it differs from the Guatemala-Belize dispute in that Article 1 of the 1859 Treaty is clearly defined. Um, this case has its genesis in Spanish imperialism in the region, which ended in 1821. Shortly thereafter, the Federal Republic of Central America was created, but it quickly disintegrated by 1839. And so El Salvador and Honduras became separate states and the principle of uti possidetis juris was supposed to determine the new international boundaries in accordance with Spanish era colonial administrative boundaries. In practice, this was difficult um, to determine the boundaries. This is due to the complex web of administrative boundaries, bodies of varying degrees, which did not always coincide territorially. There were also ecclesiastical jurisdictions concurrent with civil jurisdictions. And there was difficulty in deciphering the boundaries even among states with the same imperial power. So this helps one to appreciate the difficulty in determining boundaries between two former colonies of two former imperial powers. Now, there were six sectors that were, I'll just mention two. In the first sector of the land boundary, the parties recognized that the land under dispute was the subject of a titulo ejidal over the mountain of Tepanguisir, which was granted in 1776 to the Indian community of San Francisco de Citala under the jurisdiction of the San Salvador. And this seems very clear cut, but the court noted that there was a 1934-1935 agreement where the line in that area was specified. The court thought that the line um, was appropriate since for the most part it followed the watershed line, which provided a clear and ambiguous boundary. And the suitability, the suitability of um, topograph topographical features to provide a convenient boundary is, is a material aspect, but only in cases where there is no agreement um, to otherwise determine uh, the frontier. So first, the court looks uh, for a treaty um, where there is uh, no such um, line indicated. Then it next considers uh, geographical um, features. And this clearly won't be the case in the Belize-Guatemala dispute. Now, the second sector of the land boundary, the court simply applied the principle of uti possidetis juris um, to decide in favor of Honduras. So it, it upheld Honduras' 1742 title of Hupula based on evidence in 1742, the mountain of Hayaguanca was in the province of Gracias a Dios, uh, Honduras. So, Upon independence, title over this area resided with Honduras. Um, now, as it relates to Uti Possidetis, this principle can be seamlessly applied to former Spanish colonies um, between themselves, um, and that is to the extent that the frontier line is, is clearly set, set out. So, so then, um, this principle would not, in fact, obtain in the Guatemala-Belize dispute, since Belize is a former British colony. Um, in the Libya-Chad case, the court said that while there is no doubt that at least in principle, the doctrine is applicable um, among all former Spanish colonies, one cannot say so regarding non-former Spanish territories. And at this point, I will mention that Belize and, and the British have never accepted this principle. And so 
you would see that all the um, former British um, domains in the region are uh, sui generis, or is a fancy Latin term for unique, in the sense that you know they have never accepted this principle is applying to them. I said that I wouldn't go into the third um, case because of time constraints, so let me just uh, let me just go to um, Hot wars versus managed disputes. So in, in the cases that I've uh, mentioned before, and the one that I didn't discuss, the Libya Chad, um, there have been instances of confrontation between the militaries, which you can refer to as a hot war. And in Cambodia versus Thailand, for instance, um, 2008 to 2010, saw several border skirmishes which um, resulted in casualties and injuries. I wasn't able to determine an exact number, but you know it, it's, quite, it's quite significant. In the El Salvador, Honduras case, um, with, um, July 14 to the 18th, 1969, there are about 900 Salvadoran deaths, uh, mostly civilian, and 250 Honduran troops were killed, and also 2,000 Honduran civilians. In the Libya versus Chad case, uh, since uh, 1978 to 1987, there have been several incidents. For instance, in 1981, about 300 Libyan were killed, and about 3,000 um, Chadians were killed. And in 1987, uh, more than 3,000 Libyans were killed, captured or deserted. Um, fortunately, um, in the Belize Guatemala case, we haven't had an outright um, international incident between the militaries um, firing on each other. Um, but we've had many close calls, and I'll just recall some of them. Um, February 2000, there was a detention of three BDF um, personnel and one police. September 2014, there was uh, Danny Kornoki, a tourism um, police officer, that was uh, killed. In March 2016, there was Richard Lambe from the BDF who was, who was shot. And in April 20, 2016, Julio René Alvarado, a 13-year-old Guatemalan miner, was, was shot and um, killed in some um, in incident. And as you know, this resulted in about 3,000 troops um, amassing at the, at the border. Although nothing happened, you know, tensions were quite high. And in the Sarstoon area, we all know that also. Um, for this section of the um, presentation, I just want to thank Dr. Herman Bird because I was able to use information based on his presentation to the Bar Association to um, obtain an information. So the record of compliance with ICJ rulings, the 105 cases registered at the ICJ up to, 20, uh, to 2004, 19 were instituted by special agreement, which is about 18% about 75% by compulsory jurisdiction. Um, April, excuse me, between April 1946 to December 2013, uh, the court dealt with 129 contentious cases and issued 114 judgments. Uh, of these cases, 27 relate to sovereignty over territory or the delimitation of land or maritime boundaries. Now, since 1987 to 2003, five judgments were incompletely complied with. These were the El Salvador, Honduras, Libya, Chad, Hungary, Slovakia, Cameroon, Nigeria, and Mexico. US. And so three of the five of them are land and maritime frontier cases. And although the record of compliance with ICJ rulings is not perfect, it is very good. And here I just want to use a quote um, by Dr. Herman Bird. Every ICJ ruling concerning sovereignty over territory or delimitation 
of land or maritime boundaries have been complied with or is in the process of being complied with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for that great presentation. In the interest of time, I have been advised that we, can, we will probably have to limit the number of questions. Um, so the organizers are advising that we take up to five, maybe six questions. Um, your questions can be addressed to any of the three presenters. Mr. David Gomez uh, will be listening to your question online and he can address your question. So the floor now is open to your questions. Uh, just hold on to the mic, please. The next person can go uh, over there by the, by the second mic. The next person who has a question. And then you can go. You can make a little line so that we won't get mixed up with the order of the questions. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead, please, with your question. Okay. Yes, I have a question. Did regarding your claim that not a claim, not legal claim? Uh, you addressed that a little bit in your presentation. The wording where they were voting yes or no to Guatemala's legal. Could you repeat? Yeah. Yes. In the referendum, yes. the wording has, if we are voting yes or no to Guatemala's yeah. legal claim, I feel that it say to Guatemala's claim. No, we, no, 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 no. Uh, and that's why I made the point of analyzing that I request. I you addressed it. Because it's a, it's a big debate in certain quarters as to, there, there are certain uh, highly qualified linguists who see that question as a dangerous one in terms of its literal translation. But from the forensic linguistic uh, legal dimension, it is a question any and all legal claims mean, and it says in accordance with section 38.1 of the ICJ statute. That means any and all legal claims that can be submitted under that heading, um, it, it means that they can't bring anything else. And what are those legal claims that they can bring? Even the sense, even the term, even the term legal claim sounds as if they have a legal claim. Well, if you have one, bring it. Bring all under this Article 38.1, which is to do with treaty law, uh, customer international law, and what, what will be uh, exposed. The only legal arguments that they've advanced and they've advanced it in the past has to do with uti posidetis, whether it's uti posidetis juris, that they succeeded to what Spain had. And the counter argument to that is that they never did because they were never present in this area. If anybody from Spain was present in the area, it would have been from Yucatan. Um, and the, there's no claim from Mexico. As a matter of fact, there's a treaty with Mexico that uh, is fully enforced and respected by Mexico. So, um, and that's why I did the analysis of the request, because it is a legally framed question. It's not, uh, it's, it's legal translation is pulling the matter onto the legal heading. Nothing else can't be any other argument of a grievance or non-legal argument. It's got to be strictly legal. And that's specified by the court. Um, I don't have one person in particular that I um, will address. 
one. I would love all three. So, um, so just as the International Court of Justice and the United Nations Security Council is procedural, um, what is the turnaround time for the Security Council to act and provide security to the Belizean populace, especially considering the intent of Guatemala? As Mr. Clark mentioned, um, with the three cases he presented, they had several killings and yeah. deaths. So in order for the Security Council to yeah. look and turn an eye to Belize, um, what will it take? How long no, will it take? In the event of a hostility or a, a Guatemalan mobilization for war, Guatemala is under close scrutiny, you believe that. And so any indication, for example, that mobilization that occurred after the killing of the um, young man um, by return fire from our security forces was monitored, so we know. Um, in every event that Guatemala mobilized, British were aware, we were aware. Now, to bring in the United Nations Security Council um, would be based on a clear indication of intended hostility. Um, and, and so, something, and bear in mind that you also have a, a British presence here, which is in a training mode, but which could easily convert into a peacekeeping mode. So, it, it is not, uh, we have to be vigilant, but it can be said that you are not sleeping. We have to be vigilant. And we do not expect that Guatemala will escalate things. We've, got, we've dealt with the hostile situations. Karstun is an example of that. Um, it's a moderate move, and it's done because uh, they think they can make this move. And basically, really, I think they duped our diplomats um, and get away with it. And so they've created instability on that river area. So to answer your question about the role of the United Nations, there is a role for the United Nations Security Council. It is a, it, and it, the political affairs division, they monitor what is happening in every potential hotspot in the world. We are not a hotspot, as a matter of fact. So um, looking at Guatemala and how they have treated their indigenous and how they have um, genocide and stuff. So um, my question is, what strategies are they employing to get remote indigenous involved in this issue? I think the remote indigenous communities are acting on their own. Uh, if you look at the low voter turnout, a lot of that is reflecting antipathy on the part of the indigenous people who have been subject to uh, official repression for many, many years. Um, but there, there is an active indigenous uh, group that looks at the activities of the state in terms of corruption. In terms of this issue, uh, there are very good links between our indigenous, um, uh, our indigenous uh, communities and Guatemalan indigenous communities. Um, there is no hostile situation there. Um, somebody would say uh, the borders artificial when it comes to them. There's a transient uh, movement. I, sh I shouldn't be so facetious, but um, um, it's not a source of uh, contention. Good morning. Sir, you said that Peter Wallace never existed. Well, on the 10th of September, 1998, at our bicentennial, the Wallace clan of Scotland sent a sword about four feet long that I was there, I know, I picked up the sword and handed it to the gentleman who brought it from Scotland and gave it, and he gave it to the Right Honorable Manu, uh, Said Musa. So just hold that for a moment. Well, uh, 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 the, that was the sword yeah. that uh, Peter Wallace was a friend of King James VI of Scotland yeah. and the first of England, as far as I know. Okay, next question. Well, let me just answer that. that okay. There's no record of any Wallace ever having been um, in the region. So it's almost sounding like a, a late stage imperialist attempt. Um, well, I, I just said that the, the family, the Wallace clan of Scotland, sent a sword to Belize. 
it's still here. Okay, uh, that's okay. Next, why do we always, Belizeans are always appeasing Guatemala by calling us Belize? We are Belize, 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 Belize. Right in this very city of Belmopan, there was a street named Belize Street. So we have Spain and we have Espania. Yes, sir, we have Mexico about, and I, we have I, Mexico. I, I understand all that, but this well, I'm speaking about Belize, sir. Please yes. don't change the subject matter. Yeah. Belize no, is Belize and it's no, 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 no. Well, I, I was told, pardon me, Moderator's I was statement. told that at the United Nations, there are five different languages. Yes. Well, when they start calling El Salvador the savior, mm -hmm. Jamaica, the sorrel, Costa Rica, the rich coast. Jamaica is Jamaica. Jamaica means sorrel in, in English. I'm just saying that it's well, a nonsense well, issue. I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just I'm giving some either. examples mm -hmm. of how they, you, they're supposed to change names from Spanish to English or from whatever language to English first and then to something else. Time, I've never heard of going, Trini Trinidad, Trinidad called the Trinity or Ecuador called the, the Equator. Trinidad is, is Espanol. Trinidad is Trinidad. Who no, gave it that name? But that, that's in Spanish. Yes. What is the English uh, translation? Trinidad. <laughs> They're laughing at you because it's Trinity. Okay, but you go there but, and try but, to no, use it. Okay. But get a, get see, a Trinity passport and see what happens to you. That's right. And you get a, you get a Belize passport and see what happens to you. Well, I get a Belize passport. My, my name is Nicolas, N-I-C-O-L-A-S. I know you, Captain. And there's no H in it. And if I say, should say N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, I'll never get on a plane. I respect you, Captain. Okay. The no next no offense is, intended. No, no, of course not. Um, how do we expect to have patriotic children when on Monday passed, just a few days ago, I never saw one child marching on the 10th of September with a school. Sir, I'm in my, my mid-80s. With a what? I'm in my mid-80s. And I can still remember going to march at the age of five in a truck. With your I, Union Jack saying, we are British. Yes, we I are. I know. I had the there experience There was a Belizean also. flag. Maybe you don't know this, but there was a Belizean flag. Top left hand hoist, the Union Jack. A blue field and the right bottom fly, the coat of arms. That's the Belizean standard, sir. This is what I'm talking about. If we don't know our history, That's a different these subject. ones are going to repeat it by going That's to fight again subject. for it. We already fought for it. We cannot go and fight again, but if we have to, we must. I am saying you cannot have patriotic children when you cannot even... Sir, I tried to give away, give away a $5 bill on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. All they had to do was tell me who was the little bald-headed man on the, where the left, hand, left thumb was on the $5 bill. And 27 people on Monday, 17 on Tuesday and 7 yesterday and nobody knew who the other guy is on the dollar bill. They don't know their history. And if you don't know your history, you're supposed to repeat it. And if you repeat it, that means fighting again for your, for your country. Please, we must know. I can remember all the way back to 1944 when Chichen Acosta came into our school in St. Mary's School and taught us to sing tribute to the Bayman. I still know the song today. I know the national anthem. It was changed by one word. Land of the gods, the land of the free. When are we going to get our young people? If I did not go to school as, as a young person and came up in the classroom learning my history, I would never be as patriotic and as doggone sure I feel patriotic about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, folks, let me please remind you that in the interest of time, we need to limit ourselves to one question per person, one question per person, and uh, please um, go directly to your question. Yes, sir. Okay. Good day, everyone. Good day, Belize. Um, I'll make my question real short. It's just a clarification I would like to have from Mr. Gibson, if you can answer this for me, or the gentleman on the screen up there. Or the next gentleman over there. Um, 
I'm concerned about everything that I heard today sounds good, and everything that I've read so far, people, good for me, or good for us. My question is, is that we have five maps that have been developed about this boundary and border of our country, of our settlement, and put it that way, so correct. And I would like to ask the gentleman, which one of the map are we going to use? The one that is chosen, the one that Britain have, or the one that has been tabled by the, the most important Arden, map, Borden, the, or whatever. The, the which most one important gonna... map is the one attached to the 1859 Boundary Convention that was agreed to by the Guatemalans. That's and, the one. We, that's the one we're going to use. And uh, the British Surveyor. That's that's the that's one. That's the one we're going to use. That's the one that's evidentiary. It's an attachment to the 1859 Boundary Convention and accepted by Guatemala. Okay. And now there are so many maps of, of these, as you will see. Uh, it's a question of which is authentic and which is admissible. Okay. My second question If we is, go to court, of course. <laughs> my, sec okay. my second question is, um, I have a little problem understand, uh, 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 come to grip with uh, one part saying we have a boundary and the other part saying territorial maritime in solar dispute. I don't, can you please balance me on that? I got the full thing here to know what's going on, but I'd like to hear because Mr. Whatever, whatever is saying territory and England is saying boundary. Not really. Um, Guatemala doesn't use the word boundary anymore or border, but they uh, respect the border, which they call the adjacency line. Um, maritime areas, uh, and what you see there in reference to insular territories, maritime areas is comprehensively looking of, at all the area that they're claiming, which has varied, which in the last time around in 1999, it was the area from the Cebun to the Sars tomb, and all the keys excepting St. George's Key because the British had already won that in 1798. Um, very ludicrous, but seriously put and seriously taken and to be dealt with. My final question is, my final statement is, aren't you? Okay, all right, well, thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, after the uh, Donny Connor was shot, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said that there's no evidence that Guatemalans shot. And in your presentation, Mr. Clark used it as an example of you know, the, the problems between Belize and Guatemala. So it seems to me as if this example is used when it's convenient or appropriate for the government. Uh, regarding the ICJ ruling with the pros and the cons that Ambassador Gibson mentioned, I, I believe that despite of any ruling in favor or not for Belize, it, it won't take away poverty from Guatemala. They will still come into Belize, they will still fish illegally, hunt illegally, yeah. settle in Belize illegally. Yeah. My question, however, is um, why is the government of Belize currently um, educating uh, and is being very biased about voting yes to the ICJ instead of educating Belizeans that they have a right to vote no? That's all. I, to answer that one first, I think there are enough people in Belize who are saying that this uh, campaign should be com implemented in such a way that all sides are heard. Um, and I've heard it said that it would be done, but certainly the appearance of it is that it's moving towards uh, official campaign is trying to get a yes vote. Um, and so, obviously, there's a need to include the other parties um, who have a different view, the no vote. So I think that, is, that should be the shape of what the government does. I don't speak for the government. I have my own uh, think tank, and I do my own analyses and come to my own conclusions. Um, the other thing about the hostility that we've encountered, um, we've uh, outlined various phases of the dispute where there was belligerence, what um, Carlos called hot war, belligerent, army mobilizing, and so on. And then we had hostile situations. But there are two instances of mobilization, or three really, 
Uh, one, uh, one of them has to do with the year 2000, I'm worried about the air, when Guatemala was trying to force us uh, to start negotiations on their terms that they seized our soldiers and our security people. That's an act, that is a hostile act. Uh, they claimed there was no border, so they were in Guatemala. Uh, we discontinued talks, technical talks that were happening and said, we, we did not talk under these circumstances. And they were very surprised. I was there, I headed the delegation. They thought that they could have intimidated us into saying, well, why this could turn into war? We didn't think that way at all, at all. The other instance has to do with the Sarstoon, which is open uh, hostility. Um, turning back our boats and so on and declaring a new jurisdiction over the area. The other instances where people have been injured, in the case of Donner, um, Danny Conakry, for example, this was not military action. This is the action done by, uh, and the circumstances are known what happened there. Um, it was a, an act of a revenge by a Guatemalan whose, ha whose horses had been seized by the, by the BDF. They came in and randomly shot uh, The same thing happened with the Sergeant Lambie, where these are people who are looking for advantage um, to enter into Belize, engage in various illicit activities. Now, on the matter of the, what happens, you get a judgment, you get the line recognized, it still doesn't deal with the problem of poverty that exists in Guatemala. Guatemala has an unfulfilled revolution to deal with land and land distribution. That is the essence of the problem, and that is why there are landless Guatemalans who are squeezed out by large landholders and known uh, narco-traffickers are owning land, and they're squeezing people in the, in the uh, Peten, coming out of the Alta Vera Pass of Guatemala, and they come to Belize. No, uh, the confidence building measures and various other activities, um, what we are seeing, there has been, if you look at the Chiquibol, because of the presence of, of the military and FCD and so on, certain actions have been put in check. Illegal logging, but there's still illegal gold um, padding. People are looking to survive. So major trust of the strategy has got to be, and Belize has pushed it with the Guatemalan NGOs, um, Belize and Guatemalan NGOs, to, in, for them to engage in sustainable alternative livelihood. It's just the tip of the iceberg because there's a deeper problem of land redistribution that has got to happen there. In the meantime, we have got to be vigilant on our border and minimize the level of incursions. I should mention, for example, that there's a project between Belize and Guatemala for the protection of the Mopan River, the Chiquibul River, which enters Guatemala and re-enters Belize to join up the fall the Belize River, that Guatemalan and Belizean uh, communities have been mobilized through FCD to protect uh, that river, to stop the deforestation and so on. These things work up to an extent, but at some point in time, at the high official level, there's got to be some understanding and proactive interventions of a higher level nature to stop the incursions. Okay, we'll take our final question. All right, the final question, I do understand the students have to get back to school, and so I'm going to be very brief. Um, what concerns me really about the presentations, all the presentations I have attended, and the, the ones that I've been having done in Punta Gorda, and in Corozal, and in, in various villages, is that this government is selling us a false sense of security. Um, we need to be a realistic, I want to think. Guatemala is nothing to play with. The British are also pushing for territorial land session. The, the Americans are also in support of Guatemala. Israel is also in support of Guatemala. And we know that Israel what they're doing to the Palestinians is no easy, um, they, are, they are belligerent. I need for us to, I, I, my, my contribution here is to try to instill in the minds of Belizeans that we are standing against Israel, against the British, against the Americans, and Guatemala. We cannot afford to feel Secure. We need to be extremely 
vigilant. We need to be extremely uh, concerned about the moves by all these countries, including Guatemala, as to what they are trying to sell us. We need to have a plan B. We need to have a plan C. We need to have a plan D. Thank you. Well, you're, you're absolutely incorrect in saying that the British and the Americans are pushing for land session. Now, if you were to describe it as from a diplomatic perspective of what Guatemala has done in relation to the United States, for example, by supporting the uh, Israeli move on Jerusalem and so on, they've probably strengthened their diplomatic position in relation to the, to, to the United States of America in particular. Certainly the British, uh, historically, there was a time when uh, the Belize team were under tremendous pressure to yield territory. That was resisted. That is no longer the British position. Now, the British have a very interesting position over the past few years, which they want to be even-handed in this matter. But we have not let them forget where this thing orig originates from, and that there is certainly uh, a role for them in the event that this is seen to be needed by Belize in resolving this matter. But I repeat that you're incorrect in saying that the United States is pushing for land session. Um, so I, I say that if you're gonna pro propagate anything, get the facts right. Uh, to end the presentations, we're gonna ask each of the three panelists to please give us um, in about one minute uh, their final, a final comment. Okay, each of the three panelists. Well, if you want me to go first, uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, I think I just want to use the opportunity to wish my family, uh, friends, and all the Belizeans back home a happy and safe uh, September celebration. Um, I think uh, the Belize Guatemala issue, as P.S. Uh, Gibson has rightly pointed out, is one of the things that everybody tends to spend, or you, perhaps you're the one who said it congealer wrong okay but being belizean is bigger than that so um but just the best to everybody and hope that they enjoy this time thank you dr carl um i would just like to to say that i'm not here to tell anyone to vote yes or to vote no. I'm, I'm, I work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but at the moment I have on my hat of an academic, right? So what I presented today was um, the, the, um, research, based on the research that I've con conducted, um, which I've dedicated um, many hours and a lot of energy into, and that is something you know, that I think you should just appreciate, because, you know. So, also, um, you say if you have a heart problem and so, who do you go to? You don't go to a dermatologist, right? Because it deals with skin, right? So, it, it, you know, so sometimes when um, someone is giving their, you know, expert opinion on a certain topic and so you should, you know, you should just accept it for what it is. It doesn't mean that that's the only way to look at um, situation you know but is it just to encourage academic discourse uh, and all of that so I, I did this research for for all Belizeans you you could agree or disagree but um, you could also look the sources and, and see for yourselves and so it, it stands up scrutiny thank you uh, I want I too want to echo what Carlos just said that the idea uh, uh, what we do in terms of our analysis is to look at the fact history. It's multidisciplinary. We are looking at something involving diplomatic history, international politics, international relations, um, international law, forensic linguistics, and that issue of the question is something that will get quite a bit more discussion. Uh, but in the whole, in the final analysis, the objective is to enable a deeper analysis to help to contribute to your deeper analysis of this issue. 
in terms of its disciplinary dimensions. And so I think that was the effort um, that came out this morning, especially with David, and, um, David with his focus on the economic history, um, myself looking at international law and its application and its relevance uh, to the mode and level where we are now with this dispute. Carlos uh, doing the same thing. So I, I would like to thank you for listening. I hope we have made some contribution. And since we're a bilingual country, I want to end by saying, long live Belize and que viva Belize. Senor Sanchez. And again, thanking our three panelists. Folks, I want to use my moderator's privilege for one minute. And I want to use it specifically in relation to this extremely important theme that we're looking at today. I know I'm not asking this as a question to any of our panelists, but I want to leave it because it's a historical question. And I think it is an important question. I have shared the question with the ambassador, but I want to share it with you too. The Maya people of Belize have been here since time immemorial. They are the ones who have had effective occupation of Belize. Uninterrupted. When the British came here, they said there were no Maya. But they were. In fact, the British disowned the Maya. It appears as though successive governments of Belize have treated the Maya similarly. In fact, there was a statement on behalf of the government of Belize in the courts of Belize saying that the Maya were aliens until they came from Guatemala. So, if Belize also disowned the Maya, what if Guatemala says, you know, those Belize Maya, they were Guatemalans all along? And this principle of effective occupation could backfire on us. Something to think about. And something to look at carefully and to address if we are going to, go, if we're going to court with this as one of our biggest principles. We better be ready. Look at the history of it. Let me pass this on now to the organizers. I want to thank you so very much for your participation. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I will call on April Martinez to give us a vote of thanks. Um, can you come up here, April? Um, I just want to remind quickly to the students, visit our Facebook page, because I know you're Facebook lovers. So go on Be Belize History Association Facebook page or to our website, BelizeHistoryAssociation.org. You will find many resources on it for you to continue the conversation outside of this space. If you have questions, please send them to us. All right? Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I hope you learned a lot. And I hope that you register to vote for next year, April 2019. Um, a special thank you to the Belize History Association, Dr. McKay, and the executive members for being here today, to the National Celebrations Committee, um, the National Institute of Culture and History, through the Institute of Social Culture and Research, for providing financial aid for this. Um, event and technical assistance to the Belize History Association, again, um, Sir Nigel Encalada and Rolando Cocom for all of your hard work, um, to the University of Belize for the providing of this wonderful auditorium, to Professor Clement Sancat for, you know, signing the MOU to, with working with Mitch, 
to our presenters. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for all of the information that you are provided. I believe that everyone has learned something new and that to keep us um, informed. Thank you very much. To the high school students, to the UB students, thank you so much for taking your time out today to come and learn and listen to this wonderful event. And have a blessed day, everyone. If you have any more questions, I hope that our panelists will stay to talk to our students. So stick around. Thank you. See you all next year at the sixth annual National September Lecture.